Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Critical Conversations, where we talk about hot topic issues related to American Muslims and other targeted communities. Several weeks ago on our show, we talked about the Women's March of 2019 and talked about the way the objectives and the goals of the march and very briefly touched upon some of the allegations that were roiling the National Women's March leadership, allegations of anti-Semitism. Today, we're going to have a follow-up conversation with members of our Jewish community to hear from them directly about how they feel about those allegations and what it's like to be part of intersectional movements. And so joining us today, we have, first of all, Rabbi Ricky Kazavsky, who is the rabbi for Beit Ahava, which is the Reform Synagogue for Greater Northampton. Also joining us, we have Jackie Nyman, and she is the head of the local indivisible chapter here in Western Massachusetts. And we've also invited back to our show, Rachel Myrie, who is the director and co-founder of the Pioneer Valley Women's March. Ladies, welcome to the program. Thank you. Thank you. Great, Great to be, be here. here. So, and thank you so much for coming. And, you know, I will ask my first question, and it's really for all three of you, but perhaps we'll begin with you, Rabbi Kazovsky. So, um, you know, you heard about all of the allegations um, about anti-Semitism that roiled the National Women's March leadership. There was a lot of coverage in the national media about that. And so how did you feel when you first learned of what those allegations were and what were some of your thoughts, some of your concerns around that? So... Um so, well, first, thanks for having me on the show, and you can call me Ricky. <laughs> yeah. um, I, at, at first, I, 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 was, I was upset about allegations, mm -hmm. and, and at the same time, I wasn't surprised of the conversation, because I had been part of the women's movement since I was a teenager, through college, mm -hmm. so when I go back to uh, my early 20s, um, the, the experience of being part of the women's movement as a Jewish woman has always been complicated, mm -hmm. and there's always been... Uh, we didn't call it intersectionality back then, but um, there's always been a, a, a hard situation of figuring out where do Jewish women uh, fit, and are we seen as white? Are we seen as Jews? How do we perceive ourselves? Are we a minority? Uh, are we uh, part of the you know people of privilege in America? But mm -hmm. then there are also Jews of color, so uh, it's it's complicated and. Sure. Um, so it, it was, I mean, I think for me it was a very emotionally um, distressing time and it still continues to be something that I'm very actively engaged in because uh, the women's uh, movement and the women's march in particular, uh, had, for me, it was one, was one of the most empowering experiences sure. as a Jewish woman and just as a woman and as an activist. and. Um, uh, realizing that the conversation about where I fit in and where Jewish women fit in is is, is distressing and complicated. Um, so were you yeah. expecting this, you know, when, uh, when we had the first Women's March three years ago? I mean, were you expecting that these fissures would emerge within this particular women's movement? Uh, I, I anticipated that it would be a, 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 a part of our conversation because mm -hmm. it always has been when I pause and think about it. Um, there, I also, you know, when I first hear of allegations and when I continue to hear so, I want to be uh, inquisitive first and pause and really listen and uh, try not to be biased and um, to be very aware that often the people who are being crit criticized, such as the leaders of the women's uh, movement, are also uh, women of color, uh, a Muslim woman, um, people who I, I respect and admire deeply and have felt were role models and... Um, uh, just in incredible activists that really resonated with me as a feminist and as as a woman, but also as a Jewish woman. Sure. So when I first hear of these, I also uh, I, I really want to look into where is the criticism coming towards them, also as as women. And right. as, so mm -hmm. I look into it deeply sure. in that way. Okay, great, thank you. And Jackie, as a Jewish woman, I mean, how what was your initial response? So my initial response was actually more personal than as a leader of a group because um, I was so excited about the Women's March this year because I was planning to go to D.C. for the first time. Mm -hmm. And my first thought really was, oh, 
now there's a kink in it and, mm -hmm. and am I going to be able to do this? And I wanted so badly to be able to repeat that same great feeling I had had in the other two marches where I had one in Northampton and one in Boston. Yeah. Um, so my first thought was this disappointment and, and angst into something that I felt should be such a positive and affirming um, and powerful uh, experience. So that was my first thought. And then my second thought was, boy, that sounds really bad. These allegations sound mm -hmm. really bad. Mm -hmm. And now I'm, I'm going to have to wrestle with something that, unlike Ricky, I didn't see coming up in this mm -hmm. Women's March, which I, I wasn't considering the intersectionality of it, really. I was marching as we all were together. Right. So that took me by surprise. And so when you did your, I'm sure you did some more research about what those allegations were. So what were your thoughts? Like, I mean, what conclusion did you reach about that, that there was anti-Semitism in the way things were manifesting themselves or what conclusion did you reach around that? So I did a lot of research. Um, I struggled as, as a, a, a great rabbi I know once said to me, it's the most Jewish thing in the world you can do is to struggle with something uh -huh. and figure something <laughs> right. out. Um, yes. And so I, I, I guess I took that lifelong <laughs> Judaism and worked it this way. Um, I did a lot of research. Um, and I found two, there were two sort of anti-Semitic issues that seemed to come up. One was around, you know, um, Tamika Mallory and, and attending a Farrakhan event yes. and her statements of support of Farrakhan. And the other was older, which was around the uh, one of the initial um, planners mm -hmm. who had felt somehow pushed out of the yes. original planning because of some anti-Semitic, you know, things that had been said. That was even more surprising to me mm -hmm. because I said, oh, this has been this has been since the very beginning, since right. the inception this has happened. Sure and I was completely unaware. And I was able to find more information about that aspect than the Tamika Mallory Farrakhan issue, which is what I was originally concerned about and looked into. Sure, sure. And Rachel, you were in a very unique position because mm -hmm. um, you know here you were organizing a sister march right. here in Northampton. You heard about all of the concerns that our Jewish sisters were grappling with. Yeah. And so what did you do and how did you sort of, were you able to reach out to them to sort of get a sense of what their apprehensions were? And how were you able to sort of incorporate that into the, um, into the planning of the march? Right. I, d I did end up reaching out. I think I had that first, I'll, I will say, that kind of denial. I'm, I'm too busy to, to resistance to the complexity of it, frankly. Yeah. But um, my really my initial feeling were really similar. It was just it was, I was disappointed. I was disappointed um, that, frankly, the leadership was putting the movement in peril. I felt kind of, you know, really myopic about that. And then kind of frustration that these locally led um, independent iterations of the Women's March everywhere were being kind of potentially compromised. Mm -hmm. So it was kind of a first selfish thought. And then, you know, yeah. also real concern um, um, for, for the Jewish community um, because um, th the history of activism in the Jewish community is so large and, and so represented and, and so, so offers so much support to the women's movement. Yeah. So those are my first thoughts. Um, but then, yeah, the pause that Rabbi Ricky um, referred to came in of, oh, yeah, th there's been some amount of misrepresentation mm -hmm. from the beginning, um, a little, or at least mistrust of women of color and leadership. That's a thing. Mm -hmm. So I did the research. Um, and I, I did, I, I realized it really wasn't for me to say I really need to reach out. So I did, um, I did it on a one to one. Uh, we didn't do it something like this. Mm -hmm. But um, I, I, I reached out to people one by one. And I got a few really um, well thought out um, concerns. Um, you know, emails and and was able to talk to the community that way, and we decided to go ahead with the march. Sure. And were they Jewish uh, women as part of the planning committee for this local yes. sister march? Yeah. Yeah. Great. Uh, yep. They um, they were, and I talked to them about that, and um, uh, there was a wide variety of views. Um, yes. I think in the end, you know, these uh, most of these um, smaller marches are locally led and sure. and are are. Uh, grassroots mm -hmm. so that establishing that was important sure. um, but not also ignoring that these things were happening uh, na nationally absolutely and um, I mean I also want to talk a little bit about the way the National Women's March leadership sort of responded 
to mm. these allegations and we'd love to hear your thoughts about um you know did you feel i mean they came out and of course i mean it all started when tamika mallory attended the nation of islam's annual conference uh, some uh, she has long-standing ties with uh, uh the nation of islam because of the support that they provided her and also because of some of the anti-poverty work that they've done together um and linda sarsour was also sort of you know part of this whole um uh, issue and controversy and um and you know and of course farah khan has is known, widely known, for making very reprehensible remarks about the Jewish community, very anti-Semitic, and just is unapologetically so. And homophobic, too. And well. absolutely yeah. homophobic. <laughs> there was a whole other issue of absolute Sexist. homophobia <laughs> and just, you know, hurting the LGBTQ community to the extent that he did. Um, and so, but, and so Tamika Mallory and Linda Sarsour both um, condemned Farah Khan's words, but did not condemn Farah Khan the man. Um, how important was it for you, uh, Rabbi Ricky, to hear condemnation of the man? And did you understand when they said that we will not condemn him, but we can condemn his words? Mm -hmm. Great question. Uh, this was hard. I also lost sleep for a number of weeks around mm -hmm. this and, um, uh, you know, read everything I could. It was really the uh, dominant topic on uh, a number of my women's clergy mm -hmm. uh, groups that I'm part of, uh, Jewish women's clergy groups, I should say, that I'm part of really struggling with this. I, I, I did not feel like the condemnation or the distancing was enough. Mm -hmm. I, mm -hmm. I, um, I, I wanted to understand more because I realized I don't really understand what uh, perhaps the Nation of Islam really meant means perhaps to part of the black community or mm -hmm. to um, Tamika Mallory herself. Mm -hmm. There were a number of articles in defense of her that kept referring to how he has, had helped her family. And, you know, that part I, I can relate to as mm -hmm. a Jewish woman with other Jewish leaders. And, mm -hmm. you know, we sort of have that in our world, too. Yeah. But, um, but when something was so... Uh, disgraceful and so despicable as condemnation of gay people mm -hmm. and some of the really really virulent anti-semitic mm -hmm. tropes and mm -hmm. messages um it, it just didn't feel like enough so i really struggled sure. with that um yeah okay great and um what about you jackie yeah i feel actually very similarly to um to ricky about that i i did not think that particular mm -hmm. um response was strong enough. Mm -hmm. um, however, um, I, I did struggle, as you did, with learning about what the Nation of Islam, good things that had been done, and, um, and I was really trying to put myself in someone else's shoes in that regard. Um, and I do believe that our allies you know, someone who's on your side um, can make missteps. We all mm -hmm. do. I'm trying to think of times when I've done things and said things even as a community leader in mm -hmm. this way where I'm sure I've aligned myself with people unknowingly that had negative impacts sure. on other groups. That said, I do believe that we, you know, these are not like a la carte menu. We don't get to pick and choose little bits of, of things that happen mm -hmm. and without the, the uh, luxury, we don't have the luxury of ignoring the other parts. And I feel sure. that way about the current administration mm -hmm. and, and a lot of other things. So sure. I think if you, if you embrace it, you're a little bit embracing it, although I can understand from a personal standpoint how somebody could feel differently if their interactions with that group is overwhelming or person are overwhelmingly positive. Of course, and and also, um, I mean, both Tamika Mallory and Linda Sarsour had sort of come up with um, uh, as a response to all of you know the backlash mm -hmm. that they had faced that you know we believe in Kingian nonviolence and and the approach of that is to never condemn the man, and so we've never actually condemned Trump, but his policies, and so we're condemning. Um, uh, you know uh, what Farah Khan said, but not his words and stuff. So that was, uh, but but you still feel like there should have been much more of a forceful response, or maybe clearer, a, a clear explanation. Sure. I, I feel like it took a lot of research, of independent mm. research on my part, speaking to a lot of people and calling a lot of sources to get the information yeah. where I felt comfortable making a sure. decision about what I was going to do. Sure. And I don't think it should have been that hard to find that if the original misstep had already been that publicized and was in the media sure, that much. Sure, absolutely. And what about you, Rachel? I mean, how would you respond to their response? Right. Well, I thought, I wish they'd been quicker to respond mm -hmm. and, mm. and clearer, as you say. I, so some of that is how the media, I didn't see the media quoting their very eloquent mm -hmm. uh, apologies, yeah. um, but, but you're right. They, um, I think they could have been clearer and more forceful about that. And I, I sense some defensiveness there. 
Um, I think what they did say, you know, what was important to me um, is to see an evolution and to mm -hmm. see, you know, when, when the mistakes are going to happen, what happens after that. And I, 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 see, I see that they made changes and, and started really percolating with, the, what, with the, what, what had happened, and that's good. Um, uh, I, yeah, I, I, I had to think about the fair con. It brings up a lot of issues about condemning a person versus their beliefs. It really brought up a lot of, a lot, just in, in a general sense. Um, so I can see that, what she means by that. I can see, I can at least acknowledge the complexity of having people outside the black community, especially white people, demand that a black community leader denounce another black community leader. And she actually described it quite viscerally as you know, feeling like black on black violence. So mm. That was a pretty intense thing to say and I had to think about why that would feel that way to her. Yeah. I don't really have, you know, it's not really for, for me to, to say uh, more than that, but, um, and I think really, it, it's really, we need to center the, um, the Jewish community's response to this. Right. Because right. that's, that's when we'll know. Of but, course. Yeah, yeah, that's my reaction. And I mean, as I remember when the, the first calls came out for them to condemn, um, as a Muslim woman, I felt this, you know, this knee-jerk reaction, this sort of resentment about, you know, we are always required to make these on-demand apologies. Every time there's a terrorist attack anywhere, the entire Muslim community is mm -hmm. called to apologize, and there was a, this, you know, and condemn, uh, as if somehow they represent us, like, you know, the terrorists. <laughs> and so, and so, yeah. so there was that reaction. But also, it's interesting how um, Tamika Mari uh, sort of talked about it, because if you recall when Obama, when he was running for office, when he was running for president, um, this whole issue, the controversy of Jeremiah Wright, his pastor, came up, who had made some very, mm -hmm. you know, not very nice remarks either, and uh, Obama sort of dismissed it as saying, well, you know, it, it, we all have that uncle who we have disagreements with. So we don't necessarily, but I think it becomes very different, um, both in Obama's case and also for women's, the national women's leadership, because once you're in a position of influence and authority and like you're leading a movement, then I think the responsibility becomes a little bit more to mm. condemn something that's wrong, um, doesn't matter who, is making those wild statements and stuff. And, and I think the, the danger of that, of the lack of response being timely enough and yeah. maybe for, as worded clearly enough yes. is that we, I don't think, represent the, the typical person who's going to go to the march. I don't think anyone, all Jewish women who attended the march will spend hours researching whether or not they yeah. feel that this is the morally the right thing to do. Yeah. So they're going to see something mm -hmm. anti-Semitic, they're going mm -hmm. to spread it because it's, they've been read, read, it, read it on Jewish sites or whatever yeah. and that would be the end so I yeah. feel like it it in itself divides the movement absolutely absolutely and so um, you know do you believe that um, well even before I get to like anti-semitism in general but um, do you you both of you had serious reservations about attending this march you really grappled with it you did the Jewish thing by really grappling with this <laughs> issue but um, but you ultimately did attend and uh, Rabbi Ricky you came to the local Northampton march and Jackie you went to DC to march so what led you to then finally participate in, in the march so I guess I'll say I, it, it would have pained me to not participate. Mm -hmm. I, I, I always mm -hmm. knew in my heart, of course, I, mm -hmm. like I will be part of this. And uh, I definitely was advocating amongst my peers, who many of whom are rabbis, mm -hmm. uh, many women rabbis, also male rabbis, um, to show up at the march uh, fully, you know, fully uh, embodied in mm -hmm. your protest because that's mm -hmm. a very that's that's a very Jewish perspective I think is yeah. even if you even to come to a protest where you're protesting something about the protest wow. mm -hmm. so for mm -hmm. me uh, before the allegations about the anti-semitism in the women's march it's really hard for me to come to a march that takes place on Shabbat which oh, is our course. day yes. of rest at yes. a time that's during our religious services yeah. so if it was at one or two o'clock in the afternoon that mm. would be a to that's a different mm. picture because sure. I don't good feel like to know I'm marching with my feet <laughs> yes. and praying with my yes. feet rather which sure. is a sure. uh, you know which is a famous statement also praying with your feet you know that would enable religious Jews not just secular mm -hmm. Jews to you know, stay someplace. If they don't drive, they can they can walk there. So that to me, that was already what I was. I struggle with with every mm -hmm. with every political march, but especially the women's march because it felt so much of mm. like my core identity sure. has the potential to be present there. Um, 
So I, I really did struggle, and I, I didn't find any comfort in disassociating with the National Women's March leadership to me. And I know a number of my peers around the country felt like, well, they can go to the Los Angeles March because mm. it's not run by the National Women's March. Like, I actually like the leaders, and I'm in awe of the leaders mm. of the National Women's March, and I didn't, as much as being so conflicted by, by these allegations yeah. and by many things in, the, in this, the way the leadership model was working, um, but I, didn't, I don't see value in separating because... The picture for the rest of the world and for all of us is 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 actually one of unity mm -hmm. and is, uh, you know, it's the women's march. Wh whoever is organizing the march, it's women going out there and uh, expressing something ag against the misogyny, sure. a, a connection to our sisters, whoever mm -hmm. they are, mm -hmm. and um, so that that was peace for me personally, though. Uh, out, you know, so great to be on here. I reached out to you. I reached out yes. to Malaka and also to. Uh, uh, representative to Joe Comerford, who mm. I sent, you know, those who I saw were on the list of speakers, and who I also know personally, and said, "I'm have. Are you aware of this? The mm. level of angst and Joy. turmoil that yes. the Jewish community is going through, and and what are you going to say? And and help me. And it was a real like cry in the dark. And I, the, both responses immediately, you know, with your busy day and with Joe's busy day. You know, we're just, and immediately I hear you, I'm here, you know, we're in this, mm -hmm. and I'm, I'm, in, I'm going to mention anti-Semitism in, you know, the two or three, however many minutes mar remarks you had. It was already, had already been uh, thought about, and thank you for just sharing the depth, and we'll work on this together. And that, that felt, I felt like there was really a place for me not to come mm -hmm. as, as a protester, but to come as myself. So that was the first thing. And the second thing for me was as a Jewish woman, and as a Jewish woman leader, it also happened to be, uh, the Shabbat, where we mm -hmm. read about uh, the Israelites, the sea parting and the Israelites leaving uh, Egypt and going to yes. the promise, or just going to the desert yes. and escaping and escaping uh, their persecution. And uh, to me, the symbol of it is Miriam, who was the sister of Moses, mm -hmm. who carries her tambourine and leads the mm -hmm. women marching and singing and dancing and we protesting need at the end. Well, well, so she I need tambourine. <laughs> The tambourine. Oh. And, oh. and when I thought of that symbol, I always saw the tambourine as a symbol of joy mm. that you as music. And I realized it was a symbol of protest. Yeah. It's that she brought Absolutely. that tambourine and she right. was shaking it and crying and screaming and also joy all and mm. together. So I brought my tambourine oh. to the march yes. and I was out there shaking it. Yes. And what was really exciting was so many people you could hear a tambourine. Yes. It's kind of like yes. a whistle. Mm -hmm. you know, there were hundreds of people. I saved my voice. I didn't have to do anything. <laughs> And, there, and, and at the, there was a moment in the crowd where um, I, there was another woman with a tambourine. I kept hearing a tambourine, and I kept uh. looking for her. And I met this woman, and I said, is this Miriam's tambourine? I have one, too. And she said, no, what's Miriam's tambourine? <laughs> and she said she had gone to some protest in Spain and brought back this oh. tambourine and carried it with her now to all of her marches oh, wow. and protests. Brilliant. And we just sat there together, and I felt like oh, this is So I'm on a big oh. thing that we should... Um, Actually, in my synagogue, we're going to be decorating Miriam's tambourines in the spring for ah. Passover, but with the intention that people can write quotes on them to carry to marches and protests and in this political work okay. that we have to do together and bring our full wow. selves. So that is beautiful. That's thank how I, but thank you, because it was our oh, conversation of course. that thank brought you me so there much for sharing. fully. Thank you. Thank you. And Jackie, what about for you? Um, I think, if I'm being really honest, when I usually am, <laughs> um, I think ultimately I wanted to be convinced that it was okay to go because I really wanted to go. Mm -hmm. And I was going with the other leader of our group and she and I felt differently about the controversy in the first place. She okay. was concerned that it was being amplified as a way to divide, mm. you know, um, and so she felt very strongly that we make a big st a statement and presence in DC. So I think ultimately I was hoping I could find a way to make it okay for myself yeah. to go. Um, just like you, I reached out to smart people that I know um, <laughs> who might have something to say about the march. And one of them um, <laughs> said something that really resonated with me. Yeah. And um, that she said that if we do not allow our allies to evolve, nothing can change. And that just, I was like, that's it. That's it. We are in so many ways united in this. And if I don't allow you to make missteps and then fix them, mm -hmm. I can't expect you to allow me. And this makes us stronger together. So that was my sign. I had wow. that on my sign. And I carried that in DC. And that's wow. how it made it okay for me to go. Oh, 
Oh, that's yeah, amazing. That's and great. Rachel, thank you yeah. so much oh, for Well, I'm just seeing the string. Well, well, like the string that happened, uh, I didn't kind of even uh, see that you were talking, we were talking. It's very uh, interesting uh, how that we none of us strength, knew that that happened. Right, and this is the happened. strength of women and, yes. and, you know, diverse women and intersectional women. Right, I mean, this right, is our right. strength. Right. Yeah. And I think we try and look for that, those unifiers. Like, you know, even yeah. despite the differences, we're keep giving each other the benefit of the doubt to try and sort of work through it rather than just shut each other out and say, well, this is not working for me. Mm -hmm. So um, I also want to sort of talk about, you know, the fact that in these intersectional movements, do you feel that sometimes anti-Semitism is sort of excluded or is not given enough attention when we talk about various kinds of oppressions, mm -hmm. that that is sometimes overlooked somewhat? Uh, do you feel that happening? Do you feel that happening now in the Women's March or just other movements that you've been a part of? Um, do you want to answer that one oh, first? Oh, <laughs> sure. <laughs> I think we're going to come at that answer very differently um, anyway as not a, a Jewish leader. Mm -hmm. I have to say, in general, I don't because I don't think that I think about it. Mm -hmm. um, in general, I don't feel that I've personally been targeted or that have had a lot of anti-Semitic things happen in my own personal world. Mm -hmm. So I don't think that that was the first thing that that, stru that would have struck me about it. Mm -hmm. As I said, I was surprised to see it crop up here. Sure. Um, but every time it does crop up, I always feel that straddle of, well, am I white majority or mm -hmm. Jewish minority? And it brings that, and, and that's something I kind of almost want to just keep over there because it's such a huge, I don't know what to do with that. Mm -hmm. I don't know what to, what to do with that. So the answer is, Yes, it probably is overlooked, and I'm just not aware enough of that to happen. Um, and maybe it's because other people like me find themselves with two identities and focusing more on one than on the other when they're in, you know, in events like this. And do you feel like, I mean, just like you said about your own self, uh, that other people who are non-Jewish might see you more as a white woman than as a Jewish woman who All the is time. Yes. targeted because uh, of her Jewish yes. identity? Yes, oh. I think most people are surprised when I, you know, if, if I say that I'm Jewish, they say, oh, I never knew someone Jewish. I'm like, yes, you do. <laughs> you also right. know someone who's gay, and you yeah. also, you know, you know, all these yeah. things. Yeah, so yeah. I, I do find that yeah. that people don't don't think of me as a, and I don't even know that I view myself as a, in a minority either. Um, so I probably contribute to that, but yeah. right, right. But and even if you I mean, if they don't explicitly see you as as a Jewish woman, do they do they feel that Jewish women are white? Or do, you, do they feel like Jewish women are part of a minority? Just generally, how do other people perceive you? I mean, either whoever wants to respond to that. My impression of what's going on here is kind of what the problem is, you know, that we're trying to force people in boxes that, I mean, the whole white supremacist culture, and I mean, when I say that, I don't mean just Klansmen, I mean racial profiling and, yeah. and stereotyping, it all goes to serve this goal of keeping the status quo and this dominance uh, yeah. over people and dividing. And so you want to have people in boxes. You're the other you're white and, and or you're a man, you get these sorts of privileges. And so it doesn't do well with intersectionality. And I think that's where I find, in my humble opinion outside the community, where I think anti-Semitism gets lost because it's not fully understood because we're trying to do the boxes. Yeah. And then it's not addressed. And I don't think it's addressed forcefully enough because we're too busy talking about the boxes. Mm -hmm. When, you know, if it, I know what it looks like, I know what hate looks like, ding, ding, ding. I don't yeah. need to like know, I mean, there might be an answer, you know, whether you're, minority or white or not, but what I know is when so someone is being, un you know, is under attack. Sure, mm -hmm. sure. Yeah. Well, thank you for that. And uh, Rabbi mm -hmm. Ricky, I'll give you the last word just because we're out of time, but oh, I'd love oh, to yeah. hear your thoughts about this on as well. the same question? Yes. I'm really glad you brought up white supremacy because I felt like I wanted to, I meant to bring that into mm -hmm. this conversation early, much earlier. But, um, it, you know, I think Jewish, at least Jewish American identity is, is always been complex about where is it a minority or is it majority. I know that I, I grew up in South Carolina where mm -hmm. I was not, I was never allowed to be seen as white. Wow. So I was mm -hmm. always a Jewish persecuted, mm -hmm. uh, you know, right. seen as Jewish yeah. or outsider and it was which are you or are you from the north or the south? I wasn't accepted as a southerner for sure. Yeah. I mean, but, and, and if we, you look at mm -hmm. us, we could be sisters, right. you know, right. and um, and we probably are sisters. We are sisters. We are sisters for sure. And um, you know, and I think that's one of the questions still within the women's movement is where do Jewish women fit? And mm -hmm. that anti part of not fitting is is anti is part of anti-Semitism mm -hmm. because Absolutely. it's putting us in these different boxes and saying your oppression is more. You know, and uh, one of the things that I was really happy about uh, in the women's movement, just to bring back, is that the leadership appoint. There's now th I believe three uh, Jewish women who mm -hmm. were brought into the national 
leadership yes. and uh, and I believe they're all women of color. So the Great. interesting thing, it's like on the one hand, it's so exciting. There's a whole new uh, emergence of Jewish women of color, and uh, that was very you know visibly up front in the in the national march. And uh, um, one of them used to work for the reform movement, and yeah. April Baskin was like. I think it's just so phenomenal that she's part of, you know, that she's on that leadership now. And yet there also was still, uh, you know, criticism and discussion and a lot of concern that there's not a white or Ashkenazi Jewish woman wow. seen. So there's still this, like, what do you do about Ashkenazi mm. Jewish women who often do not, who don't really fit either. Right, so right. where is the anti-Semitism or, or healing or how, do, how are we going to... But But ultimately yeah. I just think we have to just completely stay engaged, right. which is why I will continue marching and being part of it because, the, you know, we have much more work to, still to do. Absolutely. And I mean, and there's so many different dimensions of anti-Semitism that we have not gotten into in this program at all because that's a whole different episode altogether because it, it, it warrants a lot of great in-depth discussion just on what anti-Semitism is, its various dimensions, and how they manifest in our communities, especially right now when it's growing so um, rapidly, just this resurgence of anti-Semitic hate crimes that have um, happened. Um, and so just so that our audience knows, uh, there is going to be a workshop on anti-Semitism, two workshops that are going to be offered March 17th and March 24th, and it's being offered by the Truth School here locally. And so please visit the Truth School website, truthschool.org, to get more information about exactly where and what time it is. Um, meanwhile, I'd just like to thank all three of you. For, thank you so much for being so mm -hmm. open and candid and us. sharing your insights. You gave us so much to think about, so thank you. Thank you. Um, thank and you. until next week, this is your host, Mehleka Sambani.